Um, so hi everyone, uh, this is Emma Stapleton. I am the development director for the Grammy Music Education Coalition. I'm very excited to be introducing two wonderful guests that are joining us this afternoon, offering some insight into their world as artists, uh, professionals and advocates, and how they're staying creative and active during this difficult time. For those of you that don't know, uh, the Grammy Music Education Coalition is a nonprofit, and our mission is making sure that young people have access to high quality and relevant music education programs in school. Basically, all young people having the opportunity to make some noise and learning to express themselves in their daily lives. Uh, our work now more than ever is important as schools are closed. Teachers, students, and parents need ideas, inspiration, tools, and resources to help them stay creative at home. Um, if you'd like to support our work, please consider donating at grammymusiced.org slash donate, or you can text musiced to 50155. As I said, we are a nonprofit and any dollars raised through programming today go directly to supporting young people and our mission. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce you to our guests. From last week, you'll remember Sophia Basilar, who is an incredible cellist, entrepreneur and ambassador for the Grammy Music Education Coalition. Today, she will introduce us to the amazing pianist, composer, and producer, Francesco Tristano. Uh, again, this is part of a weekly series on Instagram Live on Thursdays, so please continue to join us and contribute to the conversation. I'll let Sophia take it from here. Everyone be well and um, enjoy. Thanks. Hey, everyone. So I'm here today with Francesco Tristano, who's a dear friend of mine and an incredible pianist, composer, and electronic musician who's appeared everywhere from the Philharmonies of Europe to boiler room club sets. Um, he's recorded on Deutsche Grammophon and Sony Classical and his latest album, Tokyo Stories, which I had the incredible pleasure of seeing in New York last year live, pays homage to Japan. And it was also one of my most listened albums of the year. I don't know if you know this, Francesca, but actually I listen to your music all the time. And, um, you know, we share an alma mater, Juilliard, although we didn't go there at the same time. We actually met in Berlin about three years ago at the World Chess Tournament. How, what, what were you doing at the World Chess Tournament? I think I asked you the same question. <laughs> what are you doing there? Um, yeah. I used to uh, I used to play a lot of chess. Um, I was um, I was a, a member of a chess club, and then uh, I realized I wasn't I wasn't so good. I was better at music, so I, I went into music. But um, I think chess is one of those things where uh, the earlier you start uh, for kids is very very interesting. The uh, the ideas and the developments in the brain that chess can bring. So it, it really has a um, he has an educational um, uh, plus, I think, for like strategy, to thinking strategy, for example. Uh, and of course, music also needs strategy. So I think they're connected somehow, music and chess. Yeah, definitely. It's, it's funny, actually, I know a lot of classical musicians who are also avid chess players, and they've said that doing one or the other, even though none of them consider themselves professional chess players, um, it's a good sort of supplement mentally to what we do as musicians in the practice room because it's problem solving and it's analytical thinking and like mm -hmm. music that's something that's good for the brain and um you know it's funny because one of the things we say at the grammy music education coalition is that our goal is not to necessarily create all the next grammy award-winning artists but instead just teach children to understand music and have it be part of their education and love what they do mm -hmm. and i've noticed from a lot of former musicians or people who had a lot of music education in their development as children and young adults that it has they've also said that it's helped them in whatever field they've gone into for example one of my good friends who's a computer programmer he said that being a classical musician and being a composer was so difficult and so good for the structure learning the structure of discipline and problem solving that when he went into computer programming it was like the easiest thing compared to what he was doing before and um yeah so you have three boys are any of them playing music well, uh, they're playing chess also but um, <laughs> um actually my oldest um just beat me for the first time in chess about a week ago 
Really? And uh, so that was, a, that was a game changer because now he knows he can beat me and he thinks he can beat me all the time, but of course not, not happening all the time. But yeah, they all, they all play the piano, the three of them. Um, I don't intend them to be, uh, I'm not forcing anything. I don't want them to be necessarily uh, pl professional musicians. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, it's, it's just, it's part of the education that I want to give to them is, right. um, you know, we're, we're going to talk about Bach in a minute, but um, Bach is a kind of composer where uh, you can actually get a lot of pleasure just by reading through the scores. But for that, you have to have some kind of background that permits you to read through the score because it's kind of like reading a book, really. Mm -hmm. um, so the music education that I'm, uh, I want to give them is just that of uh, opening their minds and um, giving them uh, giving them this uh, this luggage that it's going to be for life, basically. Because uh, even if you don't uh, end up on stage playing for people, I mean, uh, it's you know, it's a it's a part of it's part of who you who you are really. If it's part of your education in the very first uh, part of your life, I mean, there's exceptions. There's people who become musicians, even professional musicians, much later in their lives. But uh, really. Uh, the brain of children uh, are so much more uh, flexible and so much more, they take so much more in. So I think it's, it's very important. It's part of, um, it's, it's part of uh, just a general education it has to be a musical education. And then if you have some more time to spare, then why not chess education as well? Exactly. <laughs> Um, so yeah, tell me, you, I know you specialize in Bach, you play a lot of Bach, you've recorded a lot of Bach, um, you recorded all the Bach concertos when you were at Juilliard, correct? Mm -hmm. Correct. And now you've been doing a Bach from the Bunker series while you've been in quarantine. Tell me a little bit more about that. Yeah, so um, I think last time you and I met, uh, the world was a very different place. It was. Um, and no one... Uh, would have uh, expected uh, the changes that um, that happened uh, since then. We I think we met end of uh, end of November in New York. Um, so uh, we all had to kind of I guess reinvent ourselves, and uh, there's a lot of questioning involved these times. Uh, a lot of confusion. I think a lot of uncertainties. Um, so for me. Um, one thing that that really helps me get get through this is actually Bach. Um, I don't feel very creative or productive or inspired or original uh, since this is day forty three now of the beginning of of the lockdown and I'm in Barcelona, Spain. Um, but Bach has been kind of um, kind of a, a door that opened uh, and it, that's keep that's just kept open all the time. Um, so I try to do my daily Bach couple of hours, maybe three if I'm lucky. And so um, I want to share this with the people. And uh, so that's why once a week, roughly, you get a Bach from the bunker, um, which I also call a Bach to basics. But um, so I'm learning new music and I'm also taking out the old music again. So I'm, I'm basically, uh, I'm just adding on the repertoire. But it's still Bach. So I mean... And like I said before, I mean, Bach is, is a kind of music that um, is already very, very interesting, provided you have the skills uh, to read it, not play it. Just take the score and read, like you would read a book, a book uh, whatever, you just take it and, and read uh, a score. Uh, but then you have to bring it into action with the, uh, with, with the fingers and with the, with the mind. Uh, so for me, um, I think it would be much harder really to get through this these days and we don't know how much it's gonna is gonna last um, I think you know by, by the time uh, who knows who knows when it's over but by the time it's over maybe I will have uh, quite a few new Bach suites in, in my fingers which uh, at least is that you know so you know it's, it's funny because for cellists we have we have the six suites and you have far more Bach music available. But um, one thing a lot of people ask me why I've never played the fourth suite. And I always, I don't know why, for some reason, I didn't learn them in order. I started with one, two and three. And then I think I went six, five and I skipped four. Um, and I always told people I wanted to save four because I also find that going back to Bach is something very wholesome and something very, um, it is really at the root of everything we do in classical music. Yes. So 
I always told people that when I was 80 and I'd done everything, I wanted to still have one left so that I would have something new to discover. But actually, maybe the time came early and I should be learning Bach for right now. Well, it's, it's smart, though. I mean, it's smart. On the other hand, um, we, of course, you know that Bach's music is, you know, is kind of universal in the sense that um, I always had the feeling Bach didn't really care about the instrument he was writing for. Uh, he wrote the same music for all instruments, and it's it's very idiomatic, but uh, meaning it's very adapted to a, a certain a certain style or a certain style of playing. But um, uh, you know Johnny John Johnny Gandelsman, a violin player, he's just um, toured and recorded the cello suites, but he plays them on the violin. So I think it's it's totally doable. Um, you know. Maybe I would even play the cello suites on, on the piano, uh, but I would have to arrange it a little bit, maybe add some voices or some harmonization or something. Uh, yeah. But it's the, kind of, it's the kind of music that really, uh, and of course Bach's music, uh, he was already tra transcribing the same pieces for different, different instruments. So uh, I think it can, uh, one score can really have uh, multiple identities. It could be on a cello, it could be on a piano, it could be um, on a violin or organ or on a clarinet, why not? Definitely, because actually I have played the Bach cello suites, um, not exactly, with, well, I have played them with piano because there is, there have been a couple of piano arrangements, piano accompaniment arrangements made, which yes. I've done. But what I've also done, I actually did also at LPR, um, where I saw Tokyo Stories with Dan Tepfer. Mm -hmm. He did that album probably more than 10 years ago now where he played all the Goldberg variations and then improvised after each one. And we did that with the first suite. So I would play movement and he would improvise the response. And actually we did that in, in Europe, in France and in Germany as well. It was really fun. Um, but it's, it's true. I've also done the inventions, uh, the two mm -hmm. inventions with violin and cello and they're totally adaptable. I think we read off the original score. We didn't even have to, um, you know, we didn't have to adapt anything. Right. Per se, yeah. yeah. So it, it is very universal. And of course, Bach is also, it's funny because the, the first prelude seems to be one of the things I, I see online everywhere now. And um, people play it on every instrument, people play it in every genre. And it's mm -hmm. one of the most universally recognized pieces of not just cello music, but I think classical music. Classical, sure, sure. Yeah. Um, I think the, um, the other piece that might have this kind of universal appeal uh, is the Goldberg variations. Uh, yeah. You just mentioned Dan, Dan's version uh, where he would alternate between improvisations and playing the score. Uh, there's, there's many versions. There's a beautiful arrangement for strings and continuo, uh, violin and continuo by Dimitri Sitkovetsky. Um, people play it um, in, in all, in all kinds of, kind of arrangements. Uh, I saw a cappella uh, version uh, of a great, great sounding um, group so they rearrange actually and they have to add voices because they have their six singing and right. um so i mean bach has this kind of um has this kind of uh, you know B bach's music is all about the uh, I, I think the um infinite melody there's a melody that's never ending you know you you start a melody and you just follow it and, and you get lost because it's going to take you everywhere it's going to take you in places you wouldn't expect uh, but then you know apart from this infinite uh, melody the score itself has infinite possibilities so you can you can take any Bach score and you know send it to space bring it into the 21st century definitely and speaking of bringing things into the 21st century you are also an electronic musician you play in clubs all the time mm -hmm. um how did you go from being a piano student at Juilliard to making techno um, it started actually before I went to uh, to Juilliard. I mean, the, the production. Though at Juilliard, I have to say the um, the music lab was a great great place uh, for me to just experiment and, and play around on synthesizers and sequencers. Um, but there's pictures of me when I'm about five or six years old, where I'm at the piano playing with the right hand, and then on the on the left. I have a, a keyboard and so uh, and then maybe on on top is another keyboard and so i'm like i'm like changing hands and changing keyboards and so i think i always wanted to do this and uh, actually that's exactly what i'm doing now uh, and then of course there's um when you are uh, classically trained whatever that means uh because i'm not sure really what it means but 
if you are classically trained, then of course it's a different, you think it's a different language than electronic music. You know, the structures are different, the sounds are different. Um, and lots of things are different. And of course, the places where you go to listen to the music, that's very different. I mean, and also the timetable, because, uh, you know, you don't go to a club at 8 p.m. You might, you might be lucky if you get out by 8 a.m. But um, so for me, it was kind of, uh, I wanted to, um, I wanted to explore this. I wanted to understand really how to make this music. And so there were a few, um, a few tracks in the mid nineties that, that caught my attention. And then uh, the way I studied them was to go to the piano and just start playing them. And so uh, I realized, you know, ideas like, uh, which are also present in Bach, like, uh, you know, in Bach's music, you get uh, one melody in the right hand, you get another figure in the left hand, I'm talking about the piano music or keyboard music. And then, uh, you know, just a minute l later, you have the same material, but switching hands. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's a technical term for that, it's the reversible counterpoint, but it's very much uh, possible in electronic music. So I started to make those connections and, um, and I realized uh, that electronic music had a huge, um, was a huge inspiration for my own music. Uh, so I, I kept playing the piano, but I always uh, I tried to uh, put more time into exploring the, um, the electronic idiom. And so basically uh, for the past 10, 15 years, I've been not trying to reconcile both, uh, both worlds, although I, I like the kind of hybrid, um, uh, hybrid idea about it, like uh, con connecting electronic music um, or electronic instruments with acoustic instruments. And um, Bach is really, it's is all over the place, but you know, Bach, he, he, I think he would, have, he would love electronic music uh, today because he would love the technology. Uh, you know, Bach, uh, he was a very serious man in many regards, uh, but he was also very much a, a man of his age and of his time. And there's documents um, about Bach's interest in the biggest technology in instrument making was organ, organ making. Mm -hmm. And organ is like a proto-synthesizer, if you think about it, you know, I mean, there's a whole bunch of technology that goes into the tubes, into the air pressure and uh, of course it's analog now we're um, we have electricity and we have a digital world to connect everything uh, but really really Bach he was uh, I think was at least uh, as interested in in the technology as, as nowadays people are when you know we're, we're holding technology just to have this chat right now so Definitely, I completely agree. And actually, it's, it's something I found very interesting when I saw Tokyo Stories live because I had listened to it um, several times and then I saw it live. And from what I understand, you pre-recorded all the electronic tracks, uh, electronic tracks and you play the piano part live. Um, for, the, for the live show. Yeah, yeah. for the live show, I, I'm, I sequenced, I mean, it depends on some shows I was, I was playing also keyboards, but uh, in New York, I only had a piano. Um, but the idea of uh, of Tokyo Stories, I mean, I, I love Japan. I've been going to Japan for, um, I don't know, 20 years or so. Mm -hmm. And so I have um, my friends, my references, my places. And uh, I had recorded one album uh, in Japan, in Kyoto. Uh, but it was a Bach album, Bach and Buxtehude. Uh, I had not recorded in Tokyo per se. And it was kind of like not a challenge but i wanted it to be really special because it's a place that has um it means a lot for me and so i was kind of daring uh, i was waiting for it uh, but it, it took some time so uh, finally two years ago uh, i rented a studio and i recorded um i recorded tokyo story what, what became tokyo stories didn't have a working title at the time um but it's really um kind of a very personal homage to uh, Neon City, as I call it. Um, and then so, you know, not only recording the piano and, and key, um, keyboards, synthesizers, but also, and that was, an, that was the first one for me, record field recording. So go around in the city with microphones and record pretty much any noise or any music, whatever you want to call it, uh, I could find. And so this has a, a very, very prominent space on the, on the album. And it's kind of like I, I wrote um, a soundtrack without a film. Uh, and so, I mean, you know, it's, it's a very uh, cinematic way of, of thinking just to, to let yourself, uh, you know, um, lose yourself with the noises of the city, the music of the city. But then I realized, um, you know, 
I need a film. Because if I want to bring this live to people, uh, I want them to experience something that they they have, uh, they can they can grab, they can uh, like something tangible, not only some sonic reference which nobody knows what it's about. Uh, and so it just so happens that my dear friend uh, Ryuya Amao, great photographer, uh, who has been following me in Japan and also in Europe for the past three years or so. Uh, was very much part of the whole uh, development of this album. He was taking pictures and shooting film. And so we took his photography, mostly still photography, and made it into a film to accompany the 16 tracks of the album. So it's kind of like each track has a little miniature uh, video clip. For yeah, it. I remember actually, we didn't get the chance to talk about that after the show, but I, I didn't realize that there was going to be a live film as well. And it was one of those right. things. And I wanted to ask you, if it had been, um, you know, planned with the music or, uh, so you, you did essentially, at the time I thought you had filmed the film first and written the soundtrack to it, but it's actually the other way around, which is very interesting. It's the other way around, but I mean, ideally, uh, that I take that as a, as a compliment. If you think, you know, the, the film was kind of the basis. Right. Um, the, the basis in many, for, for many of the tracks was the photography because it is this kind of, uh, there's stark images, very high contrast, and very, lots of black, very little light. So it's the kind of photography that you kind of, uh, you, I mean, I, I, f I find very, very inspirational because it's, it's very strong. It's a very strong medium. Uh, it's also the visual medium, of course, um, is much more direct than the, the sound uh, medium. The sound medium you have, you can process, you can kind of make out make out of it what you want but an image is an image and so the image was uh was for me this just a style of photography and so the process was that for each track we would assign one photography uh from his catalog most most were shot during the during the recording but we also took some some older shots of his and so um that became uh it became tokyo stories the way i know i I want to present it now, but it's really work in progress. You know, that's that's one of the problems in uh, in the music uh, industry. I mean, there's many problems in the music industry, but um, you know, once you publish something, it's out, and that's going to be the way it is forever. Um, and it's it's kind of too bad because the um, music is not like that. Uh, music is is something that changes over time, and um, it, it might change a lot over time, even if we're just talking about the interpretation of one piece, you know, it could be like a, a bar suite, you know, one of your favorite bar suites. Let's, let's just say that number one, I mean, you can go very, very different uh, directions with, this, with the same music over time. But once you record it and you publish it, that's the one that people will associate you with, even though maybe, you know, the, the recording was done a year ago and, you travel much further with the same with the same suite, uh, but then the funny thing is that we did have one more layer of um, uh, of publishing because just about um, just about six months ago, we actually released uh, a new format called the video album. I wasn't even aware uh, this existed, but um, I like to be part of uh, you know these these ideas that kind of come up and we're like okay, um, you know, we're part of this. And so let's, ex let's, ex let's experiment. Let's try to um, let's type, get some inspiration for new ideas. So when my, um, my guy at Sony Classical, my a &R said, are you familiar with video album? I said, no, I, I had never heard of it. He said, let's do it. And so basically what we did, we readapted, uh, reformatted some of the films for, uh, for the live show um, for, um, let's say, a small, smaller screen because that's how people nowadays mostly enjoy uh, media not necessarily large uh, you know 69 stream but just like a like a smartphone or something and so now you can also listen uh to tokyo stories as a video video album that's amazing i didn't i think i, I saw something about that but I assumed, you know, it was just the same film that I had seen live. But actually, the one thing I also never asked you about was the dance in the film. There were there were two dancers. Was that choreographed afterwards? So this is um, this is kind of um, a bonus uh, because the um, the story goes as follows. Um, I have uh, I have this friend in Japan. She's a she's a beautiful dancer, and she always wanted 
uh, she always wanted to collaborate and she had uh, this idea of doing a production together and then it could, didn't happen because of time issues and budget issues, whatever. Uh, and then I, I said that for the live show, I would really love uh, to have one film. Um, and then she actually said uh, she had something. Uh, she had shot a film on a music of mine, um, but it was a different music. Uh, but she said, I'm going to show it to you anyways, and you see if you can do something with it. And it just so happened that the track that she had choreographed this um, uh, this dance, uh, and it's a beautiful uh, traveling shot in Shibuya, one of the busiest uh, areas of Tokyo, but I was shot very early in the morning, uh, I think like 5, 5, 5.30 a.m. So there's almost nobody in the street. I, actually, it's kind of like Tokyo right now. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's like, uh, it's kind of like a forerunner. Um, and so they were kind of kind of worried because um, maybe they had they would have to get some permits for that or or but they were just shooting and then it just so happens that the music that I had in mind for this film was at the same speed, uh, the mm. same BPM. So actually the movements kind of kind of made sense. I had to re-edit um, a few things. I had to um, get my video team to, to to reformat it also, but we kind of adapted it into. Uh, into the what it you know into the last the last big song of of Tokyo Stories. So that's amazing. It's it's incredible because you wouldn't have thought that it, it looked so choreographed in the mm -hmm. sense that it been specifically choreographed for something that already existed. I thought they already had the soundtrack or something. But, but they had it was a, just was a different it was a different track. Yeah, exactly. And so you were saying that your next album you're actually going to record from quarantine. Uh, yes, I think that's the idea. Um, I mean, really, we we don't know how um, you know how long this is going to last, and right. so um, there's there's different ways to go about it. Um, one of the smarter smartest, in fact, ways is just to take it as an as given as a new a new reality, mm -hmm. and so um, I myself I need kind of challenges to get going. I don't. Um, I find it difficult to just get up in the morning, as Tchaikovsky said, and just be creative, sit down and write music. I rarely do that. But if I have a deadline, you can be sure I'll do it. Um, and so I had a talk with my, uh, with my people at Sony and they were like, can you, uh, can you conceive of something? And I said, oh yeah, absolutely. And so um, this is my home studio. Um, you will uh, maybe hear, uh, I'll play a couple of pieces for you when we're done here. Um, and so this will be, um, my studio for the next uh, foreseeable future and so um, the next album will be created uh, here. That's incredible. Well we all look forward to it and we also look forward to hearing you now. You're gonna do a short performance on the Grammy Music Education Coalition's Facebook mm -hmm. page and so I'll thank you and say goodbye so I can let you go get set up for that but thank you okay. for time to chat and Thank you so much, Sophia. Thank you, Emma. Thank you, everybody at Grammy. Thanks. Bye. Ciao. So, hey, guys, I just wanted to take a chance to say thank you again for joining Sophia and Francesco. Always um, a pleasure to hear from you guys and what a wonderful conversation about the new normal, um, how we continue to be creative and making music at this time. So again, thanks for tuning in. This is a weekly series on Instagram, a live conversation. If you have questions or thoughts on what we might talk about next week, let us know. Um, and if you want to learn more about the Grammy Music Education Coalition, please visit our website at grammymusiced.org. Um, again, we're, we're really fortunate to conclude today's live stream with Francesco uh, going to perform uh, on Facebook using the free Dolby On app. It's a great, um, it's a great tool to record and stream. Uh, so I invite you all to join us over there at facebook.com slash Grammy Music Ed. Um, and that should be live in a few minutes. Uh, so please go check it out. And again, thanks to everyone for tuning in. Uh, stay safe, be well, and um, keep your creative spirits high. Thank you.